Well, we've had several interesting voyages, and uh, today was probably the, uh, the most pleasant of the voyages. We had calm seas out there, and uh, passengers were very happy, and uh, we made a, our usual two-hour two crossing from breakwater to breakwater, and it's been uh, very, very pleasant. What effect does a rough sea or a calm lake have upon your trip? Well, like anything, any other vessel on, on, a, on water, basically, you have rough seas and you're going to have a lively trip. Uh, calm weather, you're going to have a real pleasant trip. The weather on June 4th made for a pleasant trip for the passengers from Muskegon, Michigan. It was the fourth day of operation for this Pioneer vessel. The Lake Express is the first high-speed auto ferry on the Great Lakes, the first of its kind to connect two U.S. cities. Bypassing Chicago traffic is a big draw for travelers. The boat is wonderful, really wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's a nice trip. I mean, it beats having to drive around Chicago and because I have to go to Michigan and Indiana a lot. This, this is a great, it's a great idea. I don't know why people didn't do this a lot sooner. This business or pleasure for you? Business, business, because I, I used to um, go up to Ludington. I used to go up to Manitowoc and take the Ludington ferry over. Anything to beat the traffic in Chicago. The Lake Express is an aluminum catamaran. It carries up to 250 passengers and 46 cars. It makes three round trips daily from June to September and two round trips daily in the spring and fall. Passengers travel in an enclosed climate control deck, which includes a business class section. The passenger area includes video monitors and a variety of food and beverages. The 192 foot long ferry has four engines capable of propelling the ferry at 34 knots, or about 40 miles per hour. Service began on June 1st, proclaimed Lake Express Day in Milwaukee by Mayor Tom Barrett. What this amazing boat will do, and this is the only uh, service we have like this in the continental United States, will allow us to avoid Chicago altogether when we want to travel east, and I think will also open up tremendous tourist attractions for Wisconsin residents in Michigan and equally, if not more importantly, uh, open up Wisconsin tourist attractions for Michigan residents. The new ferry service is the result of four years of research and planning. Preliminary estimates are that the Lake Express will contribute more than $20 million annually to the Milwaukee economy. The, the market research really had to do with how many people would cross, how often they would cross, how much they'd be willing to pay, how fast the boat needed to go, you know, the times of the departures, arrivals, all of that kind of general market-related information. And um, it, what it shows is that, you know, you're talking tens, fifties, hundreds of thousands of people will be crossing with economic impact on each side of the lake on an annual basis of 20 to 30 million dollars. And that's based on number of travelers, length of stay, and really the activities that they will be undertaking. And so um, this should result in substantial economic impact uh, both in West Michigan and here in Milwaukee. The information was quite positive. It did show that there is a demand for this, a, a demand far beyond traveling on it simply because it's new and unique, but a sustainable demand. While ferry service had begun, the terminal was not finished in early June. There were temporary tent accommodations at Dockside. Lake Express is located at the south end of the Hone Bridge, just north of the Coast Guard Station on Lincoln Memorial Drive. The terminal is located on city-owned land. Lake Express has a 10-year lease with options for more. The company will pay the city a fee on passengers, estimated at $150,000 per year, and lease payments of about $1.7 million over the first 10 years. Lake Express has attracted interest from throughout the Midwest and beyond for the trip, which takes about two and a half hours. I couldn't imagine they were going as fast as they were. It just, it didn't seem like it, it was so comfortable. It's like sitting home in an easy chair. 
What prompted you to take the trip? My daughter lives here, and I'm coming to see my daughter and my grandchildren. So you're from Muskegon? I'm from Detroit. Ah, St. Okay. Clair Shores, Michigan, actually. Okay. And uh, boy, this is a lot better than driving through Chicago, I'll <laughs> tell you. It was wonderful, just wonderful. Great. I'd do it again in a minute. Uh, I suppose just like a captain of any other vessel, you have a lot of responsibilities and you have to take those seriously. And I must say, being captain, one of the captains aboard this vessel, it's, it's a joy to handle and uh, it's been uh, uh, a challenge. Certainly it's a different kind of vessel, but we always uh, look forward to the challenges and it's been, uh, we've been very pleased with the, with the craft itself and it's been uh, going real well so far. Are there things you have to do differently with a ferry than you would with another kind of a ship? Well, the, uh, I suppose the tempo of operations is much quicker than, say, on a, on a tanker or our, our dry cargo vessel, but certainly in terms of responsibility, in terms of especially with the, the human cargo that you're carrying, you have to be right on top of things and you have to uh, stay on top of things. Adult fares on Lake Express are $85 for a round trip with discounts for seniors and children. Autos are carried for $118, motorcycles for $60 round trip. For more information on the Lake Express, you can call their toll-free number at 866-914-1010 or check their website at lake-express.com. Lake Michigan can now boast the first new wooden schooner to be built in Milwaukee in over 100 years, the Dennis Sullivan and the first of its kind high-speed ferry. The mix of old and new technologies in ship construction serve as a reminder that Lake Michigan was, and is, a vital transportation resource. Springtime brings new growth, and that includes more than the leaves in our urban tree canopy. Gypsy moth caterpillars start hatching and growing in early to mid-May. On May 12th, they had just begun to emerge from their egg sacs on this northwest side Milwaukee tree. A week later, they were a bit larger and showing some of the distinctive markings of the insect. For the first time, parts of the city of Milwaukee were included this year in the state aerial spraying of a bacterial insecticide to slow the spread of this damaging insect. The city of Milwaukee is participating in the DNR, Wisconsin DNR's uh, gypsy moth suppression program and what that involves is actually treating uh, areas by airplane with uh, uh, a biological insecticide called uh, Bacillus thuringius kerstaki. It's uh, otherwise known as BT. And what they do is basically fly over uh, designated areas about 50 to 100 feet over the treetops and spray the material over the treetops. Um, once this spray material comes in contact with the tree leaves, the uh, caterpillars of the gypsy moth will ingest that and uh, they'll die shortly after. The aerial spraying in Milwaukee was concentrated in six areas of the city. Five on the north side, one on the far south side. Chosen because of the numbers of moths trapped last year, the numbers of egg masses in the areas and calls from citizens. The aerial spray treatments are done in late May or early June when caterpillars are small, vulnerable to the insecticide, and leaves are large enough to intercept the spray. The caterpillar stage is the most dangerous stage of the gypsy moth. It is mostly to trees because they can be voracious eaters. I believe the mature caterpillar itself can easily eat about a square yard of, of leaf material. That's just one caterpillar. So when you consider one egg mass can contain up to about a thousand larvae, that's a lot of leaf material being eaten off one tree. These giant oak trees, a favorite meal of the caterpillar, show how serious an infestation can be. Probably older than the city itself, the trees were estimated to have about 3,000 egg masses. With up to 1,000 caterpillars per egg mass, it means 3 million could be attacking one of these oaks. This is a picture of a severely damaged oak tree. Typically we want the caterpillar to be 50% in the second molting stage of the caterpillar and 50% in the first molting stage of the caterpillar. The caterpillar, when it's at that, at that size, will, will feed 24 hours a day. 
Um, so that's the best time to, to uh, control them is when they're actively feeding like that. When the caterpillar gets up to a larger size, they'll only feed at night and then they'll crawl down the tree during the day, hang out in the shade, rest, and then they'll go back at, up, up the tree at night and, and feed again. Nearly 1,000 acres were treated in Milwaukee this year, some 4,000 in the four county metro area. The DNR says the insecticide is safe to humans. It's not harmful to humans, pets, any other life forms other than caterpillars that are feeding at that time. Um, and it is not caustic to paint, like car paint. Um, what we advise people to do is once their area is sprayed, um, if any spray material has gotten on a, any other vehicles to just wash their vehicles as soon as possible afterwards. The only possible health risks there could be, and that's a low risk, is people with asthma conditions and people who have food allergies. There might be a, a short-term irritation of those conditions. I just want to say that uh, spraying by plane is a lot more effective than spraying from the ground. Through the DNR suppression program, it's about 95% effective in killing caterpillars, and it's a lot less costly. Um, and they use a lot less uh, spray material spraying from overhead than they do from the ground. Gypsy moth caterpillars can grow to about two inches long. While the aerial spraying has been completed, there are a number of steps the homeowner can take to stop the caterpillar and reduce the number you'll encounter next spring. There are controls homeowners can do. Uh, one thing they can do is um, actually treat egg masses, any of the egg masses that they can reach. Um, it's too late for that right now, but uh, usually from anywhere from November to April, they can treat the egg masses uh, a couple different ways. They can scrape the egg masses off, uh, any ones that they can reach, and put them in a bucket of soapy water for a couple days, and uh, that'll uh, suffocate the egg mass. They can also treat the egg masses with uh, what's a product called what's uh, golden natural oil and that's basically a soybean oil and you spray that on the egg mass and it suffocates uh, all the larvae in the egg mass. Other controls um, that the homeowner can do as far as for uh, the caterpillars themselves, okay. they can actually do burlap banding. Wrap a piece of burlap around the tree and those older caterpillars will actually crawl down the tree during the day and they'll hang out in the grass or at the base of the tree and when they crawl back up the tree they'll get caught in that burlap and then the homeowners at the end of the day can actually just take the burlap off. All those caterpillars that they caught in the burlap they can put in soapy water for a couple days and that'll kill them. And that's a real environmentally friendly way of doing things for the homeowner. The caterpillars stop feeding and pupate in early to mid-July forming a protective shell. Adults emerge late July to early August Males fly off in early afternoons in search of females who cannot fly. After mating, the female lays their clusters of eggs. Gypsy moths were imported from Europe in 1869 in an effort to breed them with silkworms. Some escaped. They were first found in Wisconsin in 1971. The caterpillars defoliate millions of acres of trees each year in the U.S. The effects can be aesthetic and economic. Once a tree becomes defoliated by gypsy moth, and if you have successive defoliations of these trees, you know, two years in a row, that can open the tree up to other diseases, other insect infestations, um, cause trees to decline and then eventually die. Uh, it can lower property values for one. I mean, if you have, uh, if you have lots that are, that are wooded or even a lot that has a couple trees on it, mature trees on it, and uh, there's successive defoliations, like I said before, um, leading to the tree to die. Uh, that can actually lower property values when these trees have to be removed. With a wide variety of child restraint systems, belt systems, and vehicles, correctly installing a child restraint can be challenging. Safe Kids Wisconsin is working to prevent childhood injuries from improperly installed car seats by hosting free car seat checks, like this one recently at Milwaukee's Ebenezer Worship Center. And the focus is, is trying to prevent unintentional injuries that occur. And today we're here at a car seat check uh, to try to ensure that kids are being transported safely in their parents' vehicles. Parents can get assistance from trained technicians in the proper use and installation of car and booster seats. 
there are a number of common mistakes. There's a variety of errors. Um, I guess one of the most common is to make sure that it's installed snugly. Um, that at the belt path, um, and that's where the, the vehicle belt goes through the seat um, to ensure that it's installed. That's often not tight enough, um, so the, the car seat will move more than one inch from side to side. Other common misuses are uh, on the harness system, not having the chest um, piece in the correct position, it should be at armpit level, and there's just a wide variety. What we recommend is um, if you have difficulty reading the owner's manual, um, if you have questions if your car seat is installed correctly, come on out to one of our car seat checks, have it checked out by trained technicians, or you can give me a call and I can um, help you find a permanent fitting station that's close to you. And what a permanent fitting station does is um, by appointment, they'll, they will ch help you check your car seat. Car seats are available for purchase at the car checks, and while there are many different types on the market, there are some basics that apply to all. Basically, they start with an infant seat, um, and that generally goes from about 5 pounds to 20 pounds, and when their head reaches about an inch from the top of the seat, that's when it's time um, to move to the next car seat. So generally, depending on how fast your child grows, I've seen people move out of the infant seat anywhere from 4 months to about 10 months. The, the car seat after that is the convertible, and that's also a rear-facing car seat, just like the infant seat. And the convertible seat goes up to about 30 pounds rear-facing. You want to keep your child rear-facing until they reach both milestones of at least 20 pounds in one year. And we actually recommend that they do stay rear-facing longer than that, if possible, to the maximum capacity of the seat. The convertible seat then can also be switched forward-facing. And then that seat can be used forward facing until their child reaches 40 pounds or the tops of their ears reach the top of the seat. Then it's time to move on. And then the next step is a booster seat. And generally you think a booster seat for a child that's about four years to eight years or 40 pounds to 80 pounds. What the booster seat does is it helps to lift the child up so they can use the adult seat belt like an adult would. So it fits correctly from shoulder across the chest and down and it fits snugly over the bony part of the hips versus up on the stomach. Child should always be in the rear seat. Correct. We recommend that until they're at least 13 years of age that they should be in the rear seat. Parents are advised to read and carefully follow the instruction labels on the child safety seats. We can't necessarily make recommendations about specific brands, um, but anything that's out on the market has passed certain crash tests. You might want to do a little research um, Contact Consumer Reports, um, they usually have a report of what car seats are better than the others. And do a little research and find one that works best for your vehicle. Not every car seat works well in every car, so you want to find the one that you're going to use correctly every time that you use it. So that is the best car seat for you. Let's not forget about safety restraints for adults. In Wisconsin, a vehicle must be stopped for another violation before a driver can be cited for a safety belt violation. More than 83,000 were issued last year. In the case of children, however, there is primary enforcement if they are not properly restrained. If we tell them to buckle up and it seems to not have an effect, maybe a citation is something that can have more of an effect. It's not that we want to write tickets, but we want to make sure that children are safe, the operator of the vehicle is safe, basically the community is safe. And we hope that adults can take responsibility and make sure that the children are buckled in their seats. The message here is a simple one. Car seats save lives. And what we try to do is get out there and educate as best as we can that it's very important that these children are in child seats or booster seats that are appropriate to their age and weight. The building itself at the Villa Terrace I see is the largest and best part of our collection. Uh, Lloyd Smith, who was president of A.O. Smith at the time, and his wife uh, had this place built for them, and the architect was David Adler. And the story goes is that Mr. and Mrs. Smith uh, honeymooned in Italy, and they own two parcels of land. This parcel where the villa sits today, and a parcel of land up in Fox Point. And they brought David Adler here, and he took one look over a beautiful bluff to Lake Michigan and he said I will turn Lake Michigan into your Mediterranean and he basically did that. 
Villa Terrace, deeded to Milwaukee County in 1966, is a National Historic Landmark. Volunteers are key to its operation. Many give guided tours of the facility. Benvenuto alla Villa Sopra Mare. Above the sea, that's what it means, it's above the sea. This is a very Italian uh, 16th century home. One of the main things about uh, David Adler and these Italian uh, villas is that everything is symmetrical. You see the large fireplaces on either end of the, we call it the Great Hall, it was the Smith living room, truly. Well, we're in the library. And uh, this is all walnut paneling. Here, and you can see it's in the classical uh, style, which was, is something that the architect uh, liked to use. Um, he traveled around Europe and uh, visited the great houses when he was over there at school. Now we're in the dining room on the uh, north uh, east corner of the house. Here we've got a pecky cypress ceiling again, but Mrs. Smith uh, thought it was too dark in here, so she had it painted. But it brings out the, the special qualities of the wood that Adler uh, chose for this room. Um, again, symmetrical. In the butler's uh, pantry, uh, David Adler designed some shelves, and the background has Delft tile, blue and white Delft tile. And he used that in, I think, almost all of his houses. That was one of his trademarks. Phila Terrace was the scene of a three-alarm fire in 2002. There are few reminders of that incident. Outside, the Italian Renaissance Garden reopened the same year following a nearly $2 million renovation. Why the name Decorative Arts Museum? Fine art that we also, of course, have displayed here, painting, sculptures, exists solely for the sake of art, whereas decorative art, such as the objects we're sitting in, uh, chairs, tables, china, vases, are things that can be used, but of course are also artwork. Architect Adler's pattern of symmetry is also evident on the second floor with stairways and doors on both ends of the hallway, even though one door leads nowhere. The interior of one upstairs bedroom is a copy of a room at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. This is the floating stairway. He put many of these into his houses. Uh, David Adler did, the architect. These wrought iron pieces in the house uh, were done by Cyril Kolnick. Uh, including this uh, stair rail and balustrades. This was a bedroom also in the center of the house upstairs and uh, this, we call it the Zubair room because of the wallpaper. Uh, the wallpaper was destroyed in the fire and the insurance company paid $75,000 to have it recreated uh, by a 200-year-old French company this is the uh, dressing room off the main uh, master bedroom. The master bedroom has the uh, marble fireplace and also painted and appliqued uh, ceiling on the, the wooden ceiling. And here, of course, this is very popular in the 20s, this uh, hand-painted work. And uh, in the bathroom is a wood and wicker commode cover, which is kind of a wow factor for some people. We have a cafe on Sunday mornings here in our courtyard, uh, free and open to the public. The coffee is served along with some pastry items, some bakery. We have live entertainment, and again, it's free. It's Sundays from basically the beginning of June through the end of September. And then if you want to come into the museum or go down into the Renaissance Garden, you pay the normal uh, charge to get in, but it's a wonderful opportunity for people to come and see us. The Smith family, uh, lived here for decades and had tremendous parties and they were wonderful entertainers and it seems everybody who came in here could feel that warmth and that uh, welcoming spirit and that's something that we still today try and uh, let the people of Milwaukee experience. I've often said there isn't anything that the human mind can't create that we can't highlight here at the Villa Terrace.